Hello my beautiful love bugs. Today we're going to be going over part two of what happens in figs. So last week when I did the react video we talked about some of the edible kinds of figs and basically very generally if you want to watch the whole video it's up here but pretty generally to get you up to speed you have a fig. It's like an internalized garden. There's male flowers in the front. There's female flowers in the back. A female wasp will enter the fig fruit. She will then pollinate the flowers in the back lay her eggs, her larva will develop by eating the fig fruit stuff and they will go through their complete metamorphosis from the egg to the larva and then to the cocoons. The male wasps will emerge from their cocoons first and inseminate the female wasps still in their cocoons so when they emerge they're already pregnant. They then go out of the fig passing the male flowers along the way, pick up the pollen, leave, and find a new fig to pollinate and to lay their eggs in. That's pretty general. If you want the whole story, again, click up there. Now we're going to be talking about how this whole symbiosis thing is way more complicated than just that and talk about some other figs that aren't just the two edible species that we eat. So hang on for the ride. Let's get to it. When we talk about mutualisms, we have this very kind of romantic idea of them like, oh, the plant gets pollinated and the pollinator gets food. It's like you can almost hear like this really like tranquil music in the background. This is, might be how your fifth grade science teacher explained it to you or your textbook or even maybe a BBC documentary. But actually in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, it's not nearly that nice. Um, when we talk about mutualisms, which is a specific type of symbiosis, symbiosis just means living together, mutualisms are when the activities of both parties benefit the other. When we talk about these mutualisms, they're kind of more like each party is just trying to screw over the other party and just get what they need from it. So a really good example of this is a case of nectar robbing, where really big bees, where you would expect to go into the flower and pollinate, instead in smaller flowers, instead of passing them by, we'll drill a hole in the back of the flower and drink the nectar. This is called nectar robbing. Hummingbirds will also do this. So you can really see kind of how each party is really just in it for their own interests. Talking about mutualisms in this like really kind of beautiful, loving way is like talking about our relationship with cows. Like technically, I suppose we could consider us having a mutualism with cows. We give them a place to live. We keep them safe. They give us milk, but they don't like really give us milk in the same way that we just actually take it from them and we're not giving them a place to live out of the goodness of our hearts. We need a space for them so we can continue getting milk. It's a little bit of a stretch, but you see kind of where I'm going here. So you can see that a little bit here with the fig fruits dropping if the wasp hasn't pollinated them. Going to see that even, even more, even more so when we dive in further into the story of the fig fruits. By the way, welcome back to my channel where we talk about all things bugs and some things Ecuador. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs, and I live in Quito, Ecuador, where I do sustainable ecological bug tours. That's something you're interested in. And we're starting that up again, plus I moved, so my upload schedule has been a little bit wonky. I appreciate you hanging in there. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon because, like, I am inconsistent. Not that that's good for the algorithm, but at least I'm honest about it. I feel like even a lot of entomologists don't know the whole fig story because there are like 850 different species, each one with their own obligate pollinator. So obviously one story does not fit all. But you're here. So let's talk about the complicated relationship between figs and their pollinators. The figs that we were talking about earlier, the edible kinds, have both the male and the female flowers held within the same internal garden fruit thing. That is the fig. However, there are figs that are called dioecious, and this means that there are completely female trees and completely male trees. The female trees cannot house the wasps. The female trees produce nothing that the wasp larva can eat, and so uh, the, the, the wasp larva just die in them, and that's it. However, the female fig tree fruits will then go and produce seeds to produce more fig trees. So that's important for the fig tree. The male fig trees can house the wasps. 
The male fig fruits have this weird pseudo flower in the back that smells like those flowers and looks like female flowers, but is not and cannot produce fig trees. So if you are a female wasp, you want to always find the male fruits so that way your wasps continue living and your entire brood of eggs just did not fall to the ground and die instantaneously. If you are a fig tree, you want the wasp to pollinate the female figs because one, then you don't have to grow up any damn wasp larva and waste some of your seeds. And two, you get to make more fig trees. So you can see the direct conflict of interest right now in the beginning. If you are a big brained love bug, which I know you are, you'd be like, well, won't the wasp always just find the male fig fruits? And you would think yes. However, because this has evolved over millions of years, both the male and the female fig fruits look and smell and taste and otherwise are equally as attractive to the female wasps. So they have about a 50-50 chance of finding a male one and getting lucky and finding a female fig and being unlucky. The fig trees in this scenario are always at least kind of benefiting because the male fig fruits are producing the pollinators that it needs and the female fig fruits are producing more fig trees. So the fig tree, while it always wants the wasps to pollinate the female trees, they also need the wasp and the male ones because the male fig fruits are what are making the pollinators to begin with. So the fig tree is always kind of benefiting in some way. It's mainly the wasp that can either get really lucky or get really royally screwed. However, you would think that this would be like kind of the end of it, but it's not because the male fig fruits actively encourage the wasps to pollinate. But we're not quite done. So just like how the edible fig fruits, they'll drop the fruits if the wasp didn't pollinate, right? And that encourages the wasp to always pollinate since it is an active process. The wasp has to basically decide to do it. The male fig flower things, will only produce the wasp larva's food if the wasp had actually put pollen on it, which is crazy because the male flowers can't use pollen. It's like, it's like sperm in a male organ. Like it's not gonna do anything. However, that's like the switch to turn on the making the food. This prevents lazy wasps. This makes sense, right? Because if you are a male, fig fruit, your entire job is to create pollinators that will actually pollinate. So if you just accept the wasp without it doing any work, then you are basically saying like, yeah, those genes are fine, don't do any work for us, we don't care, and then you're gonna produce fig wasps that aren't actually going to do any of the pollination. So by having this turned on switch where the female has to go in and she has to dump pollen in a fake receptacle so that way she can receive food for her larva, then it basically only encourages and only produces the good genes of the wasps that are actively going to do the pollination. And thus is the complicated cycle. Love bugs, editing Nancy here. So I originally just planned on doing these two videos in this series. However, y'all had a lot of questions on my last video. So if you have any questions about the figs, the pollinators, the wasps, the parasitoids, anything in this system, feel free to leave those questions and comments below in the thought box. And I'm gonna do a special question and answer video with my friend Peter, specifically like clearing up a few things and answering all of your questions. I'll leave them down below and I will see you all very soon. Bye. But of course, that's only like a half of the story, maybe because now we're going to move on to talking about a couple different types of symbiosis, mainly that of parasitisms and parasitoids. Parasitoids is a specific type of parasitism where the organism that is doing all the benefiting literally has to kill its host to complete its development. This is different than something like a tapeworm that's just gonna live in your intestines for like ever and take your nutrients, but like you're gonna be relatively okay okay. Whereas the parasitoid is actually going to kill its host and needs to kill its host to complete its development. Here we are going to enter two of those. The first one is actually a parasitoid of the wasp that are inside the fig. 
Please note that while I just show one species on screen with 850 different species of figs and each with their own obligate pollinators, you obviously get a lot of different species of parasitoids as well. This is going to be generalized and summarized, depicting one on screen for both this one and the hyperparasitoid that I'm going to be showing later. So yeah, just know that there's a lot. These parasitoids are bad for the fig, right? Because the fig needs those pollinators to develop so that way they can leave and grab the pollen and then pollinate another tree. Otherwise, they've just spent all this time feeding something that's never going to help it. Research suggests that the parasitoids help stabilize the mutualism between the pollinators and the figs. So these parasitoids really are just hijacking the entire system altogether because they're going to drill a hole into the fig fruit and in that hole, they're going to lay their eggs. Inside, they're going to lay both male and female eggs. The males are going to fight with each other to try and compete for the best females, and the females are just going to eat and take over all of the wasps that are developing, so that way they develop instead, and then they're, the males are gonna die inside, the females are going to escape, and uh, no pollination happens and uh, the pollinators got eaten, the fig didn't get pollinated and these parasitoids won the lottery because they, they got all the benefit without having to do you know any of the work. So then if you think that's crazy, there's other cheaters that are like, this system looks great. We already have someone who's like cheating the system. We can cheat on them. <laughs> So these other wasps, which are called hyperparasitoids, will literally fly over, find the hole that the first parasitoid put in the fig, drop their eggs down, and then parasitize the parasites on the, on the fig wasps. Which means that like everyone just kind of gets screwed over. Again, bad for the fig all around. Bad for their first parasitoids, definitely bad for the fig wasp, and definitely definitely bad for the fig that was like supporting all of this. So why would we see this parasitoid of a parasitoid inside this fig to even begin with? Well, if you think about it, the fig wasps have a pretty good life, right? They just are inside that fig. They're really protected inside that fruit. It's really hard for other predators to eat them because they're not out in the open. So the parasitoids are basically just going to take advantage of that situation where there's a food source inside a protected area. So, you know, that's good for them all around. And then they also don't have to do the pollination, right? So then they get all the benefits with literally none of the work. The figs, however, are not completely defenseless from all of this. Figs are often covered in what are called hildebugs. Hildebugs are true bugs that use their piercing sucking mouth part to drink like sap and stuff from the plant. You can find them on the fig fruits. You think the fig would be pissed off about this, pissed off in like the evolutionary anthropomorphized sense, but you know, doesn't actually have feelings. You would assume that it would be pissed off about all of this. However, there are ants that like to milk the hildebugs. These ants, we also talked about this as a mutualism, right? Like the hildebug gets protection from the ants, the ants get food, very similar to our relationship with cows. They're basically just milking the hildebugs. They'll eat some of the hildebugs if the population gets out of control. It's another one of those complicated, messy mutualisms, which are, you know, both parties are just trying to actively screw over the other one. Anyway, so the ants are hurting the hildebugs. What's good about this is that the ants want to protect the fig because that's like their cow's pasture basically. So they want to protect the pasture from parasites and predators and other things that are gonna compete, be competing with them. So the ants will actively attack other herbivores, other things wanting to eat the fig fruits, and also attack the parasitoid. So basically, if it moves, the ant is going to attack it and yeah. eat it off of the fig fruit, thereby protecting the fig fruit and its pollinators inside. So there you have it, the very complicated relationship of figs, their pollinators, their arch nemeses, and also some other players that come in and help about. I hope that you liked today's video. If you are interested, you can look up here for some more commentary videos and down here for some Entomologist Explains videos. And I will see you all very soon. Thank you so much for being so patient as I'm moving and getting tourism back up because, like, you know, it's a, it's a thing that's happening. So see you very soon. Bye.